If we ignore the PSP exclusive Dax though, I have now reviewed all of the games in Naughty Dog's Jack and Daxter series. It now seems appropriate to move on from Naughty Dog and see what rival developer Insomniac Games were making during the same time. I use the term rival loosely as there isn't any real rivalry between the two companies, but during the PS1 they both made cartoony 3D platformers. Naughty Dog made Crash Bandicoot and Insomniac Games made Spyro the Dragon. Just like Naughty Dog, once they had made three games in the Spyro series, Insomniac wanted to move on to different projects. Instead of making a Spyro racer for the PS1, they went straight into creating a new IP for the PlayStation 2. Their first idea was a game called Monster Knight, which was going to be Insomniac's version of Pokemon. They decided to scrap that idea for another game called A Girl With A Stick. While Monster Knight was based off Pokemon, A Girl With A Stick was going to be their version of The Legend of Zelda. They wanted to make a more mature game than Spyro, so decided to make an adventure game. Even though they spent months of development time on the project, they didn't feel enough passion for it, so they scrapped the game in favour for the game I will be looking at today, Ratchet & Clank. It took Insomniac three attempts to create a new IP they were happy with, and it's the reason that Ratchet & Clank was released in November 2002, while Jack & Daxter The Precursor Legacy was released in December 2001. Ratchet & Clank has now become one of the largest series in all of gaming and has continued throughout both the PS2's and the PS3's lifespans. So, how is the original game that started it all? Should it be hailed as a PS2 classic or is the game starting to show its age? Let's take a look. I should also mention that I am playing the game from the Ratchet & Clank trilogy on the PS3 which is why the footage you're seeing is in HD. Ratchet & Clank takes place in the year 5354, in a cartoon-style galaxy filled with different aliens and creatures. The game starts with a small robot named Clank, who discovers some information he shouldn't have. He is pursued by ship and shot down on a nearby planet when he tries to escape. There, he meets Ratchet, a feline-like alien called a Lombax who is a great mechanic. Clank tells Ratchet about the information he discovered about a guy called Chairman Drek. Drek comes from a planet which is completely polluted, so he plans to take chunks from other planets to build a new one. Ratchet and Clank then team up to find Captain Quark, a famous heroic space captain, and to ultimately stop Drek from destroying other planets. The story is one of the game's strong points. Instead of throwing together any old plot, Insomniac took the time to create a story that could stand on its own out of the context of this game. Ratchet and Clank's friendship develops as the game goes on thanks to the fact that there are numerous cutscenes where they're just talking to each other. There are plenty of twists and turns throughout the game, and once you beat it, you do feel like that Ratchet and Clank have gone on an adventure together. There's also a great number of characters, including Chairman Drek, who is an evil businessman and he makes for a great villain. Each planet also has their own unique characters who each have their own quirky personalities. I would say that the story feels like certain older Pixar films, where it's overall light in tone but there are still some serious moments thrown in. Each cutscene is filled with jokes and back in 2002 I found this game to be hilarious. Now that I'm a bit older I don't find it as funny but I definitely found myself laughing at points and the cutscenes are consistently entertaining. Just like the story, the sense of humour could be compared to Pixar films, and while of course it isn't highbrow, it's impressive that most of these jokes hold up to this day. I do have one small complaint about the story though, and that's just how mean Ratchet is to Clank. Without giving any spoilers, Ratchet becomes annoyed at Clank for a good reason. However, it takes him way too long to get over this, and it makes him a bit unlikable for a big chunk of the game. This isn't held by Clank's innocent nature, as he did make a mistake, but he only made it because he was trying to help. It's not a big complaint, as Ratchet does redeem himself in the end, but when comparing the game to other Ratchet and Clank games, it's hard to get behind Ratchet in this one. It's hard to place Ratchet and Clank in a specific genre, but ultimately it is a space adventure game. You go through levels shooting at alien creatures and jumping across platforms. The levels take place on different planets in a galaxy where you must complete missions on each planet. Missions are usually as simple as work your way to the objective marker on the map and find whatever item is waiting for you or talk to whoever you find. The majority of the planets will have more than one mission, some being unessential to the story which require you to follow a different path with the level. Even though you have to take different paths for each mission, the levels are still fairly linear though, as each path to the missions are straightforward, and choosing which mission to complete usually comes down to choosing which direction to go in at the beginning. The smart design of the levels gives you a feeling that you are exploring a planet, when really the levels aren't that big. 
when you check the map, the levels are not even close to being open world, but thanks to how much is happening on screen and the way that levels circle around on themselves, you do feel like you've explored a planet. I would say that exploration is the main focus in Ratchet and Clank. As well as a sense of exploration you get from visiting different planets, within levels you will end up really taking your time to make sure you don't miss anything. There are two things you will be looking for in levels, which are boxes and gold bolts. Boxes are scattered throughout the game and they contain health, ammo or bolts, which are the currency of the game. There are numerous things you can spend your bolts on, so you need to grab every bolt you can find. This creates a more slower paced game than you might expect, but one that is rewarding to play. It's satisfying looking for all the different levels, smashing all the different boxes, to then be able to buy a brand new weapon. And it's also very satisfying when you fully complete a planet by beating all the story missions, doing all the side missions and finding the gold bolts. The gold bolts are the hidden collectibles in the game. It took me a while to pinpoint when I was playing the game, but the exploration is Ratchet and Clank's core strength and it's what makes it fun to play. Each level features many different enemies that you can take out in one of two ways, either by using the Omni Wrench 8000 or by using a weapon that is brought from one of the fenders that you come across. The wrench is useful as it does decent damage, doesn't need ammo and you can take out enemies in close range fairly quickly. The wrench is also used to turn bolts that extend bridges. There are also 15 weapons that you can use, which are the Bomb Glove, which throws small bombs at enemies, the Pyrociter, which is your flamethrower, the Blaster, which is a futuristic machine gun, the Glove of Doom, which spawns small robot creatures that kamikaze into enemies, the Mine Glove, that places mines, the Suck Cannon, that allows you to suck in enemies and then fire them out as ammo, the Taunter, that attracts enemies towards you, the Devastator, which fires missiles, the Whopper, which gives you a more powerful punch attack, the Fizzy Bomb Gun, that fires powerful missiles that you must control after fired, the Decoy Glove, that creates a dummy version of Ratchet that enemies will attack instead of you, the Drone Device, that spawns small flying robots that will protect Ratchet, the Tesla Claw, that shoots electricity, and finally the Morph Array, that turns enemies into harmless chickens. You can also buy the most powerful weapon of the game called the Rhino for an outrageous price. There is a nice amount of weapons that give you a good choice when it comes to the combat. However, by the end of the game it is very unlikely you will have brought every weapon as you have to grind bolts to be able to afford them all and some of them aren't very effective. It depends on your playing style but I found by the end I only used the Blaster, the Pyrociter, the Devastator and the Fizzy Bomb Gun. The choice is nice but the weapons don't really help keep a variety with the combat as you soon discover which ones you like and you just stick with them. The controls are basic, X jumps, square uses your wrench, circle uses your weapon, and triangle brings up your weapon wheel. There's more to the controls than that, but during gunfights that's probably all you will use. Unlike future installments, the first Ratchet and Clank does not have any way to strafe to avoid gunfire, and there is no proper lock on. Enemies will fall into one of three categories, ones that can only use melee, ones that can attack from a distance, and ones that can attack you from a large distance. Your health is split into how many different hits you can take, so no matter what hurts you, you will always only lose one section of life when you hit. These elements combined means that fights come down to being smart with your weapon choices, rather than having quick reflexes. Using the weapons doesn't take skill, but if you go into fights with the wrong one, then you will find yourself dying a lot. Whenever you encounter a new enemy, the best thing to do is to experiment with your different weapons to try and find out which one is more effective. This means that gunfights aren't really engaging, but there is an appeal to trying to find out which weapons work on which enemies. If you don't experiment that much, you can easily find yourself frustrated, as this game can be quite cheap in some areas. As you have very few invincibility frames and the controls and camera aren't designed to allow you to dodge enemy fire easily, if you try and take the enemy head on, you will find yourself taking damage very easily. The checkpoints can also be quite harsh, and you might find yourself getting overly annoyed towards the end of the game, as any time you miss a jump, you are instantly killed. I wouldn't say these problems are too bad though, as it's all part of the process of discovering the best way to tackle each area. I can excuse the harsh checkpoints, but something I don't like and think is a legitimate problem, is how the last third of the game, the best way to progress is by sniping enemies with missiles before they even notice you. I'm sure there are other ways to get through the later planets, but I found it best to stick with the Fizzy Boom Gun and the Devastator and shoot them from a distance rather than going in close as it was too risky. 
It doesn't completely ruin the combat, but it does make him go through certain areas a bit dull. At the end of certain missions, you'll be given a new gadget or item. The items are automatically equipped and give you bonuses such as additional health or discounts at the weapon vendors. The gadgets are mostly essential equipment that are needed for puzzles. For example, the Trespasser allows you to hack into certain doors by completing a short puzzle involving revolving beams into the right positions. The cool thing about the gadgets is that it adds a non-linear structure to the game. There are particular missions that you won't be able to complete when you first arrive on a planet, so you have to initially ignore them. You will then find the correct item you need on a different planet, so you can fly back to the previous planet and complete the mission. If you can't stand backtracking, then you might have a bit of a problem with this structure, but the gadgets open up new areas to the planets you've already explored, which I liked. The gadgets also add different gameplay elements such as the grind boots that allow you to grind on long sections of rails. While none of the gadgets completely overhaul the gameplay, each of them does help keep things interesting and is a nice way to break up the gunfights. There are other gameplay styles outside of controlling Ratchet with Clank on his back. The first is controlling Clank by himself. When you're just Clank, you don't have any weapons and you're very limited in what you can do. To get anything done, you have to give commands to small robots you come across. You can tell them to wait, to follow, to attack and to enter. While I don't hate these sections, they could have been better. There's nothing fluid about giving commands to the robot, so it doesn't have the appeal that Pikmin has, and the puzzles are too bare bones to be fun. The clank sections needed to be more fleshed out, as as they are, they're just there for its own sake. There are also parts where you control a ship and have to fly around a small 3D space shooting at enemies. On top of that, you also get to control a giant version of clank at certain points. I have the same criticism of these sections as I do for the clank ones. There's not enough to them to make them interesting. To play, they're okay, but when I look at them outside of the context of the overall game, none of the extra gameplay styles in this game are that good. They're all just there as something different to do. There are also two hoverboard races that you have to beat as part of the main missions. Hoverboard racing sounds fun, but all the races come down to is hitting speed boosts that are on a track, and if you miss them, you just move painfully slow. The races revolving around hitting speed boosts make them a bit uninteresting, as they feel more like you're doing a time trial rather than actually taking part in a race against other races. The main game took me around 8 hours to beat, but if this is your first time playing, then it'll probably be more like 10 hours. It doesn't outstay its welcome, but it's definitely full of content. Once you beat the game, you are then given the option to play the game in challenge mode, although in this game it's not called challenge mode, that was added to the later ones. Challenge mode allows you to play through the game again, but you keep all the weapons and health upgrades you had from your first playthrough. You are also given the opportunity to trade in gold bolts you've found for gold weapons, which are improved versions of your normal weapons. The great thing about challenge mode is that it allows you to find the secrets you missed the first time round. There's an item called the map matic that shows you any hidden areas on a planet, so on challenge mode it's clear where any secrets are that you missed. It's a great way of making 100% completion possible for each and every player, as you don't have to spend hours obsessively searching or using the internet, you just have to beat the game twice and figure out how to get to all the secret areas. To me, this is great video game design, as you still have to invest a lot of time to get 100%, but it's not annoying doing so. Ratchet and Clank holds up as a great PS2 game. The story is very well put together with a lot of funny moments, and exploring the galaxy is as fun as it always was. It's a much slower paced game when compared to later titles, but everything is designed around this slower pace, so it's still very enjoyable. Not every part of the game shines, so maybe it's just nostalgia talking, but I found this game to be as satisfying to play as when I did when I first checked it out. My score is 9.0 out of 10. Ratchet and Clank establishes the formula for future game, and while there is room for improvements, it stands by itself as a great game.